policymakers who know that the Silicon Prairie, the uh, non-coastal regions, hold as much potential for innovation and for economic growth, job creation, um, as uh, Silicon, uh, Silicon Valley on one hand or New York and Boston on the other. And uh, as Alexa says in the movie, we, we know that that's the case, but now we can show it. This movie shows that in 22 minutes and explores the implications that an open internet have, uh, has for uh, innovation um, and America's future prosperity. Yeah, if you'd like to move up, the, uh, the movie's obviously showing right here in the corner. Be followed by a panel uh, moderated by Michael Petricone, um, in which Alexis, Justin, and uh, Eric and I will, will discuss the movie. All across the heartland of America, new internet businesses are popping up in every part of every city and in each small town. Some internet entrepreneurs are inspired to design the future, while others use the internet to change how they drive America's most traditional businesses. This fall, a bus full of journalists and internet enthusiasts traveled from Denver, Colorado to Danville, Kentucky, and everywhere in between to get a closer look at these stories and to find out how the heartland has become a Silicon Prairie, representing America's new internet economy. This bus tour uh, started just out of a casual conversation. Like, wouldn't it be cool, just for the sake of getting a bus, like to just have a bus, <laughs> wrap it with uh, some kind of cool stuff on it, maybe make it half red and half blue, and then take it to a bunch of cool places. And as I think we all know, all the innovation on the internet does not come out of Silicon Valley. I think when people think of the Heartland, they think um, of kind of that rural agrarian um, uh, brand. What kind of gets uh, me irritated is that's not the whole story. It, it's all of those agricultural things, and we're proud of that, but it's also um, the urban things, and it's uh, what we're seeing is this culture of, uh, of entrepreneurship. Like, you see companies actually taking place, you see companies building. They're choosing to stay in the Midwest. In the past, people thought maybe to, to live their dreams, they have to go somewhere else. And, and I don't begrudge anybody who chooses to go somewhere else, I just don't want you to think that you have to go somewhere else. Who knows where the next Silicon Valley will be? I think that the Midwest is probably as primed as anybody to be a place that leads and continues to lead as we go into the future. I, the potential for the Midwest is limitless. Iowa does three things. Uh, we grow corn, uh, go to the state fair, and we caucus. What do you tell someone who doesn't really use the internet like you do? How do you convince them that they should care? And I think one of the challenges with the internet is that, like a lot of great things, it is hard to define. It is hard to quantify, it is hard to say why it matters so much other than from your visceral experience. But I think of it like the national parks, like a common good, like a freedom or something that we know that we must keep and treasure, that we have to pass on to the generation that follows us. How can we look at the internet in a way that actually provides opportunities for us we wouldn't have had 10 years ago? I don't think there's one specific initiative other than starting that conversation. This conversation around the Internet's role in innovation and opportunity is starting all across the Midwest, among politicians and entrepreneurs alike. Denver is uh, the number one destination for 25 to 34 year olds who are moving to Denver on a scale that's not being matched anywhere else in the country. 
get to Kansas City. We're going to be letting as many startups as possible live in this house. There's going to be no rent. We're going to pay for utilities. We're going to pay for the fiber. And so it was just natural for us to start a business here. Um, and then it turned out to be a great place for us to grow the business. We get the sports knowledge, we get great technologists and talent coming out of the college. We now have people who can sit in their own homes and do business around the world and make a good living and be successful. We are continuing to develop that resource in Kentucky. I'm excited about startups in Kansas City and um, I really think we could build something great here. I feel lucky that I'm in the Midwest to be able to be part of this movement and this good energy. It has to be easy for people to communicate and transcend geographic boundaries. It has to be easy for people in one state to work with people in another state. I think we'll look back 20 years from now and view this as the way that many, many new companies and communities revitalized themselves post the Industrial Revolution. We would not exist if not for the internet. STLstyle.com existed before we had a retail storefront. We were, we were an internet-based retailer. If you check out our map over there, um, you'll see people come here from all over the place. That's the internet. The advent of the internet and um, just the progression of, of smartphones and everything has really helped transform urban neighborhoods that are in transition like Cherokee Street. Ten years ago, this, this block was abandoned, not much going on here, and now in the past ten years it's really coming alive with artists and activity and a lot of, a lot of new businesses moving into this neighborhood. I think we have the most romantic internet story ever. <laughs> It'll be six years, like October. We had never met in person and we started building this website together and emailed and called each other and like looked at each other on MySpace and... <laughs> so we've always been in separate cities, so we've always been shooting things back and forth. So we really were just totally based on just what we could do online. And the opportunity for this space came up, so we jumped on it. We're a little destination spot. People come here just for us. We're growing, we're doing well. We want you to come in and experience it. We want you to walk by and be amazed by the windows. Being this huge driving force, we're just this little company, but we're one of the many voices coming from this street, coming from St. Louis, coming from the Midwest, saying these little companies are important. A lot of what's going on in the street is happening due to the internet, because there's a lot of events that go on and people hear about it. Word of mouth, all digitally word of mouth. A Facebook event will go up, or there'll be a picture being taken of any of these buildings, and it will be on Instagram. Basically because of the internet we get to have a company, because of the internet we get to talk about it, because of the internet we have investors, because of the internet we can work remotely. If it wasn't for the internet, I'd be living, I mean, I'd be a bum. My name is Ben Milne, we're in Douala, and Douala is a payment network that bypasses existing uh, credit cards and debit card networks. The savings is definitely significant. So if you think about every time you pass, uh, you receive payment over like a plastic card, you're going to lose on average about 2.9% plus 30 cents a transaction on every single transaction. Obviously, if you're partaking in a $1,000 transaction, you don't want to lose that money. If you're doing a $100 million transaction like a lot of banks do, obviously you don't want to use that system. Dual is basically the solution to that problem. So basically, that exchange or that software can be utilized anywhere connected to the internet to exchange money for any reason by anyone or anything. It could be people, it could be companies, it could be parking meters. Des Moines is definitely a place where creation is embraced, not um, shunned. We're all kind of investing in the greater good and doing our best to build the communities and connecting our communities that have talent to the outside ones as well.
I like coming to work every day. You work with smart, happy people solving meaningful problems. Well, I feel like every day I'm excited to get out of bed and I come to do something I really care about. middle of August rolls around and football season starts ramping up for our teams. We are working 24-7. The site has to stay up. I'm John Wirtz. I manage our product team here at Huddle. We like to say we're democratizing the highlight video. In the past, an athlete could pay some serious money and get an amazing highlight video made and you know he's going to have an edge over maybe an athlete at a rural school that doesn't have those resources. With Huddle, we're really leveling the playing field. Every athlete can make an amazing highlight. Friday night, football team plays their game. They're gonna videotape the whole game, a lot of times from multiple angles. So they plug their cameras into their laptop. Huddle software grabs the video off the camera, puts it online, and cuts it up so that they can break it down and share it with the team. Usually by late Friday night, the team has the whole game on their iPhone, on their iPad, um, in their web browser you know, ready to watch what they did well, what they didn't. As soon as the play is happening on the field, they're entering in the down and distance, what the gain was on the play, was it a run or a pass, you know, was it a touchdown? As soon as the video hits our servers, we've already got the data from the phone. We marry that up and now they've got this amazing asset. We've actually had athletes at this point now that have gone from a youth team to a high school team and now are getting ready to go play college football and will have used Huddle at all three of those levels, which is really special. This will be the first time we hit that point. And it's all internet powered, and it's enabling the athlete probably more than anyone else to be better, perform better on the field, you know, get recruited and get a scholarship and go to college for a lot of athletes that may not have been able to go to college. So if you tend to think that there's, it's not possible to make high-end, uh, engaging games uh, in the Midwest. Uh, this is proof positive that it's, it is doable. My name is Ben Vu. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Skyvu Entertainment. We are about five people back in 2009. Now here we are in, in Midtown Omaha at 29 employees, and we're set to double that amount by the end of 2013. How does a team in the Midwest, Omaha, Nebraska, five guys in a basement uh, compete against the likes of EA or THQ or Activision uh, making mobile games? We obviously made a brand that was catchy, edgy, uh, original, but couple that up with uh, the internet community, the fan base that was able to talk about Battle Bears on Facebook, on Twitter, and we were very fortunate that uh, it caught on and here we are. And it all starts here with these, with these drawings. All local artists that we've recruited and trained. Uh, these are artists that I would like to say are capable of working at some of the top animation studios or even game studios for that matter. Uh, but we're lucky enough to have them here in Nebraska. Here we are, 18 million downloads later, uh, with a television deal in hand. And uh, we're going to take the Battle Bears franchise to the next level. Through the use of internet and co-creation, products can be made faster, more efficiently, and at a much lower cost. So what you see here is the Rally Fighter. This is our first production vehicle, uh, one of hopefully many to come. It is a street legal desert racer. Thanks to the power of the internet, we actually own the world's largest automotive collaborative community. Right now we're pushing about 30,000 members, 250 of those people. Uh, contributed in one way or another to the design, development, and launch of the Rally Fighter. Now the coolest part of the build process is the customer actually comes to our factory for six days and helps put together their Rally Fighter. The issue is the economy and jobs, and there's not a greater engine for economic growth in this country than the internet, and we want to make sure that it's free and open and innovative for the future. Innovation does not have to come out of Silicon Valley. We all know this, but now we can show it. I don't live. 
for high tech gadgets, but 90% of our customers come from the internet. So I mean, it's a fact Sarah, of life. It it's here. I mean, I, I got to deal with it. An open internet affects everybody, even even the guy who doesn't check his email, but every yeah. other couple and, of and days. I, and <laughs> I, believe it or not, I'm high tech compared to most of these guys. Right? My brother used to take me to the farmer's market, and so I've always had this connection to food. Being raised by a single mother, my brother stepped in and cooked for us. And he went on to become a chef. He took like that situation where he had to step in and be, become that, and like turn it into this thing to where he loved food. But he like infected me with that as well because he would say, you know, food is about relationship. Everything in life is about relationship. It provoked me to create this internet company and found this company. AgLocal is a web-based platform connecting high-value meat producers directly to high-margin buyers. We're getting these high-value meat producers into the into the store shelves, into the restaurants the same way. Amazon for our food production, not just meat, but we'll you know, My wife was a little scared, it was so crazy. I said, I'm gonna do it, and she's like, okay, I'm with you, right? And I come home from work and the whole house is empty. She comes out and she's just like, I sold everything on Craigslist so you can start paying developers. That belief that she had was just really inspiring for me. This is important for the world. The internet has a unique power to create a platform for justice and to create an economy. And I felt like with this, we could use the internet to really like even the playing field. Consumers definitely want to know where their food comes from. And so to be able to facilitate this, it provides more sustainability in these businesses. You know, we've been able as a country to produce things that, <laughs> that, that have radically altered the world. When you've got no barrier to entry, you don't have to ask anyone's permission, and you have a bunch of people who are already very well accustomed to solving their own problems and helping themselves, the internet is such a great platform. What's super important is that anybody who's interested in creating and enabling a startup community needs to recognize how fragile these things are. There needs to be a positive view towards the development of these rather than the attempt to control uh, or impact or constrain it. You know, here in Kentucky, uh, we want an open process and open access to the internet because we understand the value of it. We work with 11,000 high schools, um, and there's very few companies in the country that work with that many high schools. Dealing with firewalls is something we do every day, and it really it does hamper your business. It slows us down. It's actually pretty painful to hear uh, these teachers talk about how they can't use the phenomenal resources that are on YouTube to teach. We get a little taste of what that could be like when things aren't available and open. The internet has been the engine for so much social change and economic growth, but at its core, it's actually really fragile. My name is Holmes Wilson, I'm a founder of Fight for the Future, and we organize mass campaigns for internet freedom. What happened last year is that two bills known as SOPA and PIPA were introduced in the US Congress. SOPA and PIPA would have let copyright holders shut down entire websites for linking to copyrighted content, even when those links were posted by users. SOPA and PIPA were so broad that they threatened the sites internet users and businesses rely on every day. The internet fought back. Websites went dark in protest, and millions of users took action. The bills were defeated, but it doesn't end there. The next SOPA or PIPA may be a lot more subtle, and it may not even be about copyright. It might be about privacy, patents, access, or censorship. There are so many powerful players with reasons to limit openness and innovation on the web. But now, internet users are seeing just how much power they can have when they speak out and stay involved. You should be able to create whatever you're about to create, even if it's a question, without someone telling you that you can't or without worrying about where that question goes. The moment you start putting restrictions on things, um, it, it stifles creativity. So far, people have been willing to make the trade and say, wow, 
I can have 30 million documents, 10 of which I don't like. Okay, I'll go for it. What I worry about is that tolerance getting chipped away bit by bit. As people say, okay, well, let's not have this piece of information. Let's not allow that piece of information. And the problem for those of us who are consuming information in an environment like that is that we don't know what we're missing. You know, we don't know what the next innovation is going to be. You know, there's some kid in his dorm room here in Kentucky or somewhere else in the country that has the next great idea that's going to be the next big internet company that's going to create jobs and economic growth. And policymakers can't anticipate what that's going to be. And so you can't make a regulation in the world we know today that's going to prevent the next innovation of tomorrow. We want to be able to tell that message and prevent the next SOPA and PIPA from happening. It's really, really, really important that we understand the nuances around the way that the internet has grown previously, to understand the jobs that it will create going forward. What I want to tell people is, the next person who doesn't value the internet, tell them about the future and tell them how the internet will be for their grandchildren. We do not want to take away from the future because we were too short-sighted. Although the internet is not this magic wand that's gonna, it's not gonna save the world instantly, what it is gonna do is it's gonna enable all those awesome people to actually be awesome in a way that they couldn't have before simply because of something as stupid as access. And I, I just wanna see more good stuff in the world. I want better startups and nonprofits. I want better politicians. And now those people who otherwise may not have been able to can. Since the beginning of time, we human beings have wandered around the world to find out what each other is doing so that we can mimic it and do it ourselves. And uh, that's the core thing. Get information out there into people's hands so they can change their own space. CES. That was that was positively inspirational. That that epitomizes everything that we try to do in Las Vegas and everything that CES is about. The transformative power of the internet. Um, that was awesome. So we're going to talk. I'm going to introduce our panelists. We're going to talk a little bit and then do a few questions and answers. Uh, I am sitting here with Alexis Ohanian, co-founder of Reddit. Eric Martin, Reddit general manager. Nadine Mazin, director and producer of that film. Uh, Justin McIntosh, who is the producer, and Michael Be Beckerman, who is the president and CEO of DC's newest technology association, the Internet Association. And in DC, the more technology associations out there working for the right things, the better, Lord knows. Um, so, uh, you know, it's funny. Sometimes people in DC say the problem with tech policy is the future doesn't have a lobbyist. But you're sitting here with five of the best. So I think we're in good hands. Uh, let's talk first about your inspiration for the movie. Um, Reddit was obviously a, 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 key, uh, a, a key factor in the defeat of SOPA and PIPA. I, I got to tell one quick story. I was in a meeting with a member of Congress who didn't ordinarily engage in tech issues. And I was trying to convince him that breaking the internet was perhaps not such a hot idea. And I wasn't getting much of a read from the guy. I wasn't getting positive. I wasn't getting negative. And the meeting ended. And I got up to leave, and I walked out, wasn't sure how it went. And one of his staffers pulled me over and said, don't worry, we're Reddit readers here. <laughs> In other words, everything was going to be OK. And it was. Um, but how did, how did that experience with SOPA and PIPA and your engagement with the policy world you know, lead to the, the idea for the bus tour? Well, um, and, and, and I appreciate all the love Reddit gets. Um, but Reddit was one platform of many that a bunch of Americans used to take action. 
Uh, and what we saw on the 18th on that blackout day was literally millions of Americans calling up their senators, calling up their representatives, you know, making a lot of noise in the true democratic fashion and connecting and showing that, you know, calling your rep for the first time isn't as scary as you might have thought it was. And, and what was so striking was that everyone kept talking about it as a battle between Silicon Valley and Hollywood. And I know it's a good headline, um, but it's a lazy headline. And the reality is all of America versus the entertainment industry was the real story. <laughs> And I just got to talking with Eric about this idea of doing a bus tour, but it was a much smaller idea. I, I just thought it'd be fun to get a bus. And in true collaborative fashion, Eric made the idea a whole lot more awesome. Yeah, and one of the, one of the things, you know, sort of like that, there's two misconceptions or, or, or you know, uh, lazy sort of stories out there after Soap and People. One was that it was just about Silicon Valley and Hollywood. And the other is that it was just about, you know, these sort of, uh, you know, companies like Facebook and Twitter and Google. And so what we want to show is that it's not just about Silicon Valley, it's about every town, every, every uh, city in the country, and also about every sector. So we're like, okay, let's take a bus and let's go out there and let's show that this, you know, the, um, the power of the internet has the, has the ability to change meat <coughs> and how we get our food. It has the ability to change money and how we, how we pay and uh, handle our, our financial data. It has the ability to change the automotive industry with the manufacturing and uh, done by co-creation and local motors, uh, sports. I mean, it has ability to change high school football coaches, which if any of you have had a high school football coach, that's not an easy crowd to disrupt, but they're doing it. So that's what we wanted to actually go out there and find and, and show. And I, I don't think that um, Eric and Alexis were stretching and putting this together. You have a bus tour, you get things on the schedule, and, and it shows a, a view that, that – um, you know, it's highly produced, but we had stories falling out of the sky. We had <laughs> Cliff Misson, who ends the movie there, uh, sending four terabyte drives to places in the United States and abroad that don't have great connectivity so that people can use um, independent sneaker nets to improve their internet research skills and, and improve their access. We had, um, we had like, you know, stories hitting us. Skyview was a story that wasn't on the tour, and they came out of nowhere to, you know, to tell us what, what they were up to in Omaha. Um, so it, these stories are totally ubiquitous. This is a very small sample size, and it wasn't um, um, artificial in any way. Yeah. And to be clear, when, when Eric and I announced this, we had no itinerary. We just knew Denver to Danville, first presidential debate to the vice presidential debate, and the entire internet responded in filling our schedule with probably too much stuff. Uh, we didn't have enough resources, enough time to hit every one of them. Michael, down at the end, uh, and, and Michael is, spends a lot of time on, on Capitol Hill talking to policymakers. I, I think one of the reasons why so many members signed on the bills like Sofa and Pippa was because they didn't really think that these internet issues affected them. They, they, because the internet is an issue for like a bunch of people in San Francisco and a bunch of kids in Brooklyn, and that's it. And in reality, this, this internet-driven innovation is going on everywhere in their district, whether they know it or not. How do we how do we let members of Congress know that, that these are issues that affect their constituents? And, and how, do we, how do we convince them that, these, that this kind of internet-driven innovation is going on in their district right now? That's a great question. So every member of Congress, every senator, they're a reflection of their state or their district, and that's how it should be. You walk into any office and they can rattle off like that um, who their top employers are easily. They can tell you who their, their biggest industries are. If they're from a, um, a state that's big in agriculture, that's you know their primary issue that they care about. And like you mentioned, unless you're from maybe California or New York or some other hubs, you don't really see yourself as a member of Congress as an internet member. And we need to change that. And I think what this documentary shows and what we're going to help um, you know push over the coming years, since this is a new and growing industry, is that every single congressional district, every single state is an internet district, is an internet state. Because these businesses, these small businesses are relying on the innovations and the tools of the internet to grow. And you know, you take a company like Scarlet Garnet, which we visit on the tour, it's a jewelry company on Main Street <coughs> in St. Louis. You'd walk by that and never think in a million years that it's an internet company or it has any impact from the internet. And it does, they started on the internet, they sell 70% of their jewelry online, they're using social media and their businesses like that all over the country in Main Street. And as soon as we start telling those stories of these small businesses in every congressional district, then when you walk into the member's office from somewhere in the Midwest, 
he'll say, yeah, one of the biggest industries that impact my district and jobs is the internet, and I care about it. And that's the message we need to tell. Great. Uh, all right, so to many people who saw this movie, many of you in the audience, even to me, you, you see this vibrant innovation community in the Midwest, and uh, you have no idea. It's like this, this hidden economy. Um, so can the Silicon Prairie serve as a blueprint for the development of other kind of localized innovation ecosystems across the country? And what do we have to do to make that happen? Or conversely, what do we not have to do to make that happen? Well, I know there's a, there's a blog called Silicon Prairie News that has a very big chip on their shoulder because the typical tech publications sort of disregard most, most of the innovation that happens in the Midwest. And these are real companies. These aren't companies that are just launching features or apps to share photos of your cat, which are valuable may not have clear business models. These companies are making money. They are growing, they are hiring, like they're real businesses. And, and unfortunately, uh, I think like a lot of stories that happen in the Midwest, they don't get coverage because they're not near New York, or in this case, also near the Bay Area. Um, but what's so clear is these things are springing up. They're happening because, and Brad Feld's been a great proponent of it. His book, Startup Communities, is a really good read. Um, it shows that you know if you get a couple of hard driving people who are really earnestly passionate about building up a startup community, that's what it takes. It takes someone who just says, you know what, what the hell, I'm going to do this, and 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 certainly governments can play a role in facilitating it. But at the end of the day, it's people. It's always been people, and and there's some young woman right now somewhere in some small town who's probably reading Hacker News or hopefully will watch this documentary and think, all right, I'm going to put insert small town on the map uh, and see who else is interested. Cool. I want to follow up on the point about Brad Feld, who uh, appeared in the movie uh, briefly and actually sat with us for a couple of hours and outlined the steps that, that communities can take. And, and one of the main things, as Alexis said, is that it only takes a couple of, uh, of leaders um, in a given community for that, for that community to become a hub. Um, but it, it requires them to take a, a long view. And when I asked Brad, when you say a couple of leaders, I was thinking, you, know, you need like 100 leaders. How many, how many entrepreneurship and, and high tech leaders does Boston have, for example, and I do think of it as a hub. He said it probably takes, you know, half a dozen or a dozen. And I was really surprised and impressed. You know, the suburb I grew up in, the village my dad grew up in, uh, both have between six and 12 high-tech leaders. Um, and that has huge implications for America and huge implications worldwide. And now the question is, which potential hubs can take a long-term 20-year view and can coordinate and network with, with the hubs that are making things work in order to take notes and, and follow along that trajectory. Great. Uh, so, and, and Michael knows this, when you go in and talk to policymakers about internet freedom, you often end up in these very like hazy, philosophical, academic discussions. Getting back to the movie, for the entrepreneurs featured in the movie, just in, in very practical terms, what does, what does internet freedom mean to them? What does it empower them to do? Yeah, I mean, what it means is that, um, and, and Alexis pointed this out very well in the documentary, is you know, the internet has lowered the bar. All you need now is an idea, and you have the chance to reach millions of people around the world and create a business from just an idea. And um, often, you know, policymakers don't really think about that. They regulate in the world they know today. They legislate in the world they know today. And the great thing about the internet, it's about tomorrow. It's about innovation. And something that's static, like a soap or a pippa, could prevent you know these people in small towns with you know two or three person businesses from ever having a chance to grow and create jobs and economic growth. With the entrepreneurs that you talk to, how aware are they of of these DC policy debates? How aware are they that some of the things they kind of take for granted they're able to do on the internet are actually quite tenuous, and that? they need to engage in order to make sure that they, they stay that way. I mean, yeah, I, I think they, they may not be, um, you know, super aware of, of the kind of legislative process or the, the individual threats coming, but they are a, very aware of how tenuous and how fragile um, their business model is. Take a company like Huddle. So Huddle is, uh, is the company that uh, deals with high school sports. Uh, they have 70 employees. They've been profitable for three years. Uh, they're doing really well, but uh, if you know things like data restrictions, um, you know, or uh, data caps, or um, you know, even policies by different school systems come in, they're done. Um, 
So, you know, there's copyright issues around some of the, the game footage, things like that. I mean, they, their whole business model and, and this amazing company they've built, built in Lincoln, Nebraska, and all the high school, you know, school systems they've helped save money, and the coaches they've helped save time, and the parents who they've helped to get their kids scholarships, you know, this could all be turned off with a switch. And so they're very aware of that sort of fragile nature of, of this platform of the open internet that they're working on. And when it comes to engagement, um, we, it, it's really run the gamut because we spoke before students at the University of Nebraska and, and we ran a fun little exercise with them. And this is all credit to Ben Huff for turning me on to this app. It's called Contact Congress. I just fired it up right now. It's a free download, which is always nice. Uh, and because of your location, it'll tell you right now who the two senators are for the state of Nevada, as well as the local representative. And with the push of a button, you can place a phone call to their office. And, and it's a really simple exercise. We actually tested it out in Nebraska. We had to leave a voicemail because it was 5.30, and I guess he was done working that day. Um, <laughs> But, uh, startup. <laughs> yeah, definitely not startup hours. Uh, but the point was, Sopa Pippa showed millions of people, many of whom participated in the, electric, in, the, in the political process, probably for the first time in their lives, like actually contacting their representative or senators, that it was not only doable, but that we had power, right? $94 million in lobbying was used by Hollywood that year, and it was defeated by millions of Americans without any, without any top-down coordination or money, just a bunch of people using the internet in a very leaderful way, showing that, hold on, voters still can win over lobbying money in Washington. And, and for a bunch of young people who have grown up using this technology, I'm very jealous of them because they've lived with an internet connection in their home their entire lives. Um, they, they see this as access. They expect, they expect better out of their representatives because they expect better out of their companies. They expect better out of their nonprofits. And it's really, really hopeful. It makes me really, really hopeful. Um, but it was that lesson that I think so many of us learned, including myself, that holy shit, we actually have power. And thanks to the internet, uh, it's, it's quite, <laughs> quite the opportunity to flex our muscle. You know what's interesting? Attempts to regulate the internet have been going on for a while. And then all of a sudden, last year, as you said, some 50 million Americans stood up and said no to Pippa and Sopa. And it seems somewhere along the line, the internet issues went from like a fairly fringy, techy, mainstream group of issues to an issue, a mainstream issue that everybody cares about. You, me, our moms and dads care about. And I know a lot of people, especially people in DC, were blown away. Nobody saw it coming. What happened? In a word, ubiquity, right? When you saw that farmer, 90% of his <laughs> orders came from the internet now, that dude checks his email thrice a week, okay? And his farm in Richmond, Missouri, which is barely on the map, cannot exist without the internet. And when it's affecting him that much, I mean, it, it's a sample of how much it affects so many of us now whose lives so revolve around the internet. And also that policy isn't just about constraint um, and, and restrictions that we might face through legislation. It's also about, I mean, policy can be an attitude. And, and when legislators put pressure on, for example, big business to think forward, yeah, there's a lot of money in data caps, a lot of money in uh, connectivity. There's a lot of money in, um, uh, you know, copyright takedown notices. But there's a lot more money in openness. And when Huddle, at the end of the interview in a, in a section that wasn't published in the movie, they talked about how incredible bandwidth will be for the next generation of their business. And when we can get past data caps into, you know, into a, a business model that works for the um, big, big telecom companies and for the consumer and for the businesses, the burgeoning businesses, that's really, I mean, we can, we can have a policy attitude that's more about encouraging all of the players and all of the actors to, um, uh, to promote economic growth. So I, I, I think over the last year, we've shown that the, 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 the mass engagement of the internet is very effective at stopping things, even at long odds. Thank you. Um, but I guess the next step, the question is, can it advance a positive agenda that would protect our rights online? And what would that agenda look like? Uh, anybody can take it. Yeah, I think it's already started. Um, we saw the, the Declaration of Internet Freedom, which I hope you all take a look at and sign if you like it. A number of senators and representatives already have. Um, there, there is, what we have going for us is not only the fact that the vast majority of people in the world <laughs> agree with it, um, but also that it's a promise of hope and potential and innovation. Um, there is, 
it's, it's very saleable, right? When you can not only show all of the good it has already done, but all of the unimaginable good it can do if we don't screw it up. Uh, and so what I think we want to do now is start to get more of those stories, stories like these, but also real people in the heads of every one of these elected officials so that when they make the decision, they really do worry about squelching the next Facebook. Uh, and they really do worry about what it means to not have access to everyone to, for affordable internet to everyone in their district uh, and start telling those stories. And, and one of the ideas that actually came about because of the Boulder meetup we did uh, was something that's affectionately known as Geek Day right now, which is hopefully going to be a flash mob on Washington um, where we basically get someone from e literally every district in the country, uh, and we might do a beta test at the state legislative level, um, but we get everyone to come in with some sort of basic list of asks, right? A few very simple, concrete things that they'll ask of their representative and their senators, so that we can all come in with appointments, well-dressed and polite, <laughs> and very sternly make an appointment, or very sternly make the case, rather, uh, to our elected officials. Uh, that this matters to us and that there is actually a face and a person attached to this sort of vague issue uh, and so that they, they know that there is someone who cares in this district and who comes with some very clear points as to how they can not only not screw it up but also bring tons more value, tons more job creation and tons more innovation to their home. I can also just yeah. tell a quick story about the production of this film. In When making a documentary film, especially on this sort of short timeline when you just go out there and like we're just shooting footage and then you come back and you have all of this footage, you have this hundreds of hours and you start watching this. We're, we're thinking to ourselves, what's the story here? Like, wh what is the story in all of this footage that we're gathering? And initially we thought it was like this warning. It's like, it was about SOPA and PIPA, it was about internet policy. People were really concerned about it on the tour, but, but, and so we started to sort of assemble this that way. But then we realized that the real story is, is a positive story. It's a, it's a very hopeful story in that, you know, there's all of these places all throughout the country with really smart, creative people that want to make their town better. They want to make their country better. They want to create a new product. They're looking for solutions. And they're <coughs> using all the means at their disposal to do that. And a lot of their means that they feel um, our most powerful are technological means, our internet means, our ways to connect with other people. Um, and so we sort of wanted that to be the main message of the film, is this positive narrative. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And I, I think Michael will probably agree to this down at the end. When you're in D.C. and you go talk to policymakers about the internet, 90% of the time, the question or the, the, the discussion about is about some problem. It's about privacy violations, or it's about infringement. How do we let policymakers know and, and, and convince them that actually what the internet enables is this enormously transformatively positive thing that, that needs to be supported and promoted? Yeah, I think that's, that's probably right, and I think it'll, um, it's something that'll take time. You know, it's a brand new industry in the scheme of um, our country and uh, you know economic development in this country, but it's something that's impacting every sector. And you know the more that we can get into the positive stories like these that we see in this documentary, and be able to better quantify um, how many jobs is the internet creating in agriculture, how many jobs is the internet creating in manufacturing, how many jobs is it creating in you know um, you know consumer products or shopping or um, you know bill payment um, or whatever it might be, um, and how is it impacting people's lives in a social way? You know, social media has you know, given a voice to, you know, press people all over the world. And, you know, the more that you can start having those examples and it gets into the forefront of members' minds, it'll be less, less about complaining about things they don't understand and more about, wow, this is an amazing tool to create jobs. You know, our country, we're trying to mount an economic um, recovery and create jobs. I mean, this is the, this is the driver here. And uh, it's an important thing for policymakers to understand. You know, one of the most remarkable elements of the whole SOPA and PIP experience was the coalition that was aligned against the bill. You go into these meetings and you'd see people like Holmes out there with Fight for the Future sitting at the table next to the Tea Party guy. And in this divisive environment in Washington, is, is internet freedom the only thing that perhaps all Americans agree on? I mean, I, I don't know about all the Americans in, in D.C., but all the Americans that, that we talk to, and we talk to people at truck stops, um, 
We talk to people at the high school football games. I mean, even people who aren't familiar with some of the, the policy issues, when they ask, like, what, what the hell is that bus in the parking lot doing, and why does it say Internet on it? You know, they got it. They got that the Internet is a frontier. Um, and that's, that's as American as it gets, this idea of a frontier and this idea of hope and this idea that you can determine your own future. You can determine your own, you know, uh, uh, success or, or failure. And that's what the Internet provides. And every single person we talk to, they just got that emotionally and they got that, you know, uh, inherently. And so, uh, you know, I think if, if we can convey that message and we can show examples of that taking place and examples of people creating these companies, um, or doing, you know, uh, uh, social justice projects or whatever, um, then, uh, you know, hopefully that the people in D.C. can also recognize that as well. And, and to your, your uh, question also, um, you know, this is an issue that crosses party lines. You know, we're in very, very contentious times. Um, you know, the parties are fighting. We just came through a, a contentious election. But if you looked at the two conventions for the, the both major parties, they both added to their, um, their policy planks, their platforms, Internet freedom. Republicans did it and the Democrats did it. Uh, and I guess that that's probably the only area that they both kind of agreed on. It was probably the only area where they both amended their platforms to add the same thing. And it's, it's amazing. You know, the Republicans did it for one reason. The Democrats did it for another reason. That's fine. You know, folks on the right, you know, support Internet freedom for one reason and folks on the left support it for another. That's fine. As long as at the end of the day, they're together. And this can be one of those rare issues that we can bridge the partisan gap um, and maybe get something done or prevent something bad from happening because it's not an issue that's a Republican issue or a Democratic issue. This is an issue for, for all of us. And this issue is also a very yes and issue. Uh, Holmes joined us. Nimblebot does um, uh, interactive video. We try to make video more interactive rather than just consumptive. And uh, we were with Holmes doing an experiment in uh, uh, London at MozFest, Mozilla's uh, uh, festival, and, and the discussion was open internet. And uh, we created a little remixed uh, uh, piece based on Holmes's work uh, advocating for open internet. And there were 12 constituents around the table. And every one of those constituents was able to say yes and to this remixable message. Yes, open internet, and I want to translate it to my language. Yes to open internet, and I want to make a more radical tone on this for my uh, you know, congressman, policymaker, my own constituents. <laughs> You know, yes, and I want to back off the tone and make sure that it's educational first and radical second. So, you know, there, there's going to be diversity of opinion along all number of conversations, but I think um, digital storytelling uh, is one example of a medium in which we're going to be ex able to express a, a wide variety of nuanced opinions around uh, something as important as open internet. Okay. At this point, I'd like to open it up for a couple of questions. And I'd, I'd please identify just who you are and who you're with. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Daniel Tenorio. I work for a company that's called Pixie TV that is in the United States, but it was founded in Chile outside of the United States. So my question would be, how do you see this? Because when so many people appear, there was a reaction all over the world because it would have affected <coughs> How do you see this project going outside of It is unfortunate that, in a, well, it's potentially fortunate uh, that a lot of tech policy in America sort of sets a tone for the rest of the world. Um, if we get it right, it could be a great tone. Um, but we've seen, we, we see this symbiotic relationship. Uh, and we, we dropped the ball on ACTA, for instance, specifically, we Americans. Um, but look at what Europe did in the months following SOPA and PIPA as we saw activists coming out. I mean, we, whether it was elected officials in Poland wearing Guy Fawkes masks in Congress uh, or whether it was protests all over uh, European countries, um, it was clear that they fed, these, these movements sort of fed off of each other. And so much of the success that Europe had in thwarting ACTA uh, was, I think, sort of residue from the success we had here in the States. And more often than not, we saw people saying, hey, I live in blank country, not America. How do I help SOPA? How do I help against SOPA, PIPA, and then vice versa? Um, the, the, the great thing about this platform we have is it is a truly international one. Uh, it's a truly global one, at least in the countries that allow it to be. And so, I, you know, hopefully this documentary is, is interesting and curious and inspirational to people elsewhere. But more importantly, there are documentaries to be made about Chile. I mean, Startup Chile is a fascinating case study, specifically. Um, but these are happening all over the world. And when I look at countries like Estonia that are now looking at 
building K through 12 education that involves computer science. Uh, when I see countries making very forward thinking moves at a national level, I think, damn, America, come on now. <laughs> like, this is, there, there are opportunities here to learn from one another. And, and yeah, you know, hopefully, hopefully it's an entertaining flick. Um, but this, this project isn't limited to just the Midwest. It's not just limited to the United States. It's, it's, glo it's a truly global phenomenon. The question is, how do, we, how do we up the volume day to day on this thing, not just in response to a crisis like SOPA and PIPA, but, but data privacy, copyright laws, uh, it, it's, it's kind of like a, a looming crisis. And I think the, the public hear this and feel negatively about what's happening to them, worry about data. And so I think that, that we've got to get the positive message across. Um, uh, and, and how do we, how how do we, we increase who, that volume? Who, who wants to take the question? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start, I guess. Um, I don't agree that it's a looming crisis, I and mean, I think that individual users have a better se um, sense and understanding of how the internet works than their members of Congress, and that's fine. I mean, they'll, you know, they'll learn, um, and I think what we need to do is, to turn up the volume, is each individual and small businesses need to contact their member of Congress and their senator, and, and tell them on every level, from you know, mayor on up to senator, and tell them how they personally are using the internet, what they're getting out of it, how their business has hired new people because of their internet, the internet, how their business has reached new markets because of the internet, how their daily lives are enriched because of the internet, and explain that. Just so when next time when we go in on a meeting on a, some bill, you know, be it something at the you know huge um, impact like SOPA or something maybe small incremental that might be problematic, the member or the senator knows. They've talked to their constituents. They know the companies like Scarlet Garnet. They know the companies like Ag Local. They know. Um, local mo motors and others in their states and districts, and it matters to them. I mean, that's what every member is a reflection of their district, and that's how it should be. It's elected, you know, your elected representative. Yeah, and right I now, they don't see, you know, with the exception of the tech hubs, um, they don't see their districts as internet districts, and they will because they are. And I'll so when those stories start going, then that changes the, the dialogue. I'll jump in and say that one project NimbleBot has been engaged in for three or four years and, and will uh, ramp up this year is teaching kind of lay people how to do digital storytelling. It's surprisingly easy. It's a couple days of training and it's access, free access to the equipment you need, uh, editing bays or, or cameras, what have you. We'd, we'd really like to partner with, you know, uh, those who are interested in policy engagement and storytelling to make sure that every one of the communities we visited can tell their own stories. And every one of these advocacy organizations is producing their own videos. It's, an, it's a really important. And, and maybe there's even some campaign that could be made out of that, like, uh, you know, a Twitter, ha Twitter and YouTube hashtag that's like how it affects me. And just people giving their personal story of like how the internet affects them. Right. Um, and, you know, get crowdsource that message, you know. I mean, that's really what happened around SOPA and PIPA, and it seems like we could do the same thing for the, the positive, hopeful message as well. Good. I'm going to take the moderator's perspective and ask the final question. Alexis, you have often talked about the Internet as a way to empower individuals and work around gatekeepers. You're currently working on a Kickstarter that, that is really in the middle of those themes. Would you like to talk about it? Oh, sure. This was not <laughs> planned, uh, but thank you. Um, all right, the short version of it, uh, March of last year, just a couple months after we defeated SOPA and PIPA, uh, a gentleman named Lester Chambers, soul legend behind the Chambers Brothers, posted a photo that went viral on a subreddit called R Music. That photo basically showed how, despite having produced tons of hit music for decades, the recording industry literally paid him nothing, nothing in royalties, and today he was poor, uh, living hand to mouth for years. Uh, because the recording industry simply just never cut him a check for money due. He signed a really terrible contract, and for decades, 
the music company just said, ha ha, get a better lawyer, good luck. And so that story went viral, as things tend to do on the internet, and we just happened to uh, be able to get in touch with him about a month or two ago, and a social enterprise that I started called Bread Pig, don't ask, it's a pig with bread wings. Um, we basically said, listen, Lester, there are a bunch of new platforms out there, and I'm sick and tired of hearing the recording industry talk about how they were doing this all for artists. All they care about was artists' rights. And so let's show just how much they care <laughs> by showing this story and then showing how the internet could make right what the recording industry did wrong. And so to date, we actually have a day and a half left in his Kickstarter campaign, and he's raised over $60,000 to produce this album, which he will wholly own. And the name of the Kickstarter campaign is? Oh yes, Lester's Time Has Come. What is it? Okay, we Lester's, almost, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, go on. Lester's Time Has Come dot yes. com. Wait, a, get on the site, check out, question. it's amazing. All right, so we gotta wrap up. One final announcement. I see a lot of DC people in the crowd. We will also be premiering this movie in DC at the museum on a much, much, much larger screen, January 15th. So please, everybody's invited, please come. Let's have a huge hand for our panel, that was great. And we have limited edition bus tour pins. Get them while they last. There's only a few left. Collector's items. Sure, Michael. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a,